I've been transcribing a lot of Paul Jackson recently, and I've come to the conclusion that he is one of the grooviest bass players of all time. He's best known as the bass player for the Headhunters. The Headhunters were established by Herbie Hancock in 1973 and combined elements of funk, jazz, and soul. So in this video, we're gonna look at three examples of Paul Jackson's amazing work with the Headhunters, and we're gonna analyze them to see what makes them so great. The first track we're gonna look at is Watermelon Man off their debut record, Headhunters. The bass line has the note F as the tonal center, and it starts off with an open E leading into the root note F on the first fret. Then we have a lot of space, and then these tenth chords, or double stops. These tenths are essentially major chords without the fifth. They work particularly well on bass, as we have this large interval of a tenth between the notes, which avoids any muddiness, which you can often hear when playing chords on bass. The interval is called a tenth, as it's the third displaced by an octave. So if you count through the intervals of the major scale, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Here we see them used in a unique way. They're acting as chromatic approach notes leading to the F. On the second time round, we get a slight variation. The addition of the F being played on the higher octave, like so. The next bass line we're gonna look at is Swamp Rat from the 1976 album Secrets. Now this intro might be the grooviest thing you've ever heard. There are some really interesting components to the bass line. For example, the bass doesn't play on the first beat. The godfather of funk, James Brown, had the philosophy that everyone would play and emphasize the first beat of the bar, cementing it as a stylistic element of the funk genre. This song breaks that rule with amazing results. Like Watermelon Man, we get all this space. He really understands the importance of not filling up the bar with too many notes and using space to create a more effective bass line. The notes being played are on the E of the open string. Then we get octaves on the C sharp and the D, and then a hammer on from the D to the E. The presence of the C sharp over the E minor chord suggests an E Dorian tonality. That's because the C sharp is a sixth interval and the characteristic note of the Dorian mode. And then finally we have this fill. We have the E, a muted note, a hammer on from the A to the B, another muted note, a rate mute, and then we have this vibrato on the D. The final bass line is Spankle E from the 1973 album Thrust. This bass line has a lot of variations, so let's just analyze the first couple of bars. So contrary to the first two bass lines, here we have a lot of notes. You can consider this as a 16th note groove, as there are a lot of fast 16th notes and muted notes being played. Because there's so many notes, it's hard to define the tonality of this bass line, but I think the best way to analyze this is either from the Mixolydian mode or the dominant seventh chord, with all the other notes acting as chromatic notes to connect the chord tones. The chord tones of the dominant 7th chord are a root, a 3rd, a 5th, and a flat 7. The mix and lydian mode is a great choice to play over the dominant 7th chord, as it contains all those notes, plus the addition of the 2nd, the 4th, and the 6th. And the other notes we're going to consider as chromatic passing tones. What Paul Jackson bass lines have I missed? Let me know in the comments. If you'd like to support this channel, you can purchase my ebook you can find the link below. Thanks very much.